Hi, David McKinster again. We're going to talk about the problem of induction. This talk is meant to supplement Russell's chapter on the problem of induction in his Problems of Philosophy. Um, Russell is very largely uh, discussing in that chapter problems that were raised by the uh, uh, 18th century philo Scottish philosopher David Hume. David Hume would be on anybody's short list of the really important Western philosophers today. That is uh, in no small part because in the early part of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell uh, advanced, uh, if you will, a revival of interest in the, in the works of David Hume. Hume uh, actually influenced a number of philosophers in his time, including Immanuel Kant, you know, one of the, one of the big heavyweights of Western philosophy, who wrote, "'Twas David Hume awakened me from my dogmatic slumbers." Actually, Russell, in his History of Western Philosophy, quotes that and then quips, unfortunately not for long, um, you know, Hume uh, was in Bertrand Russell's uh, estimation, you know, a far more insightful philosopher than Kant was in many ways. Okay? Um, <clears throat> David Hume today would be interpreted differently than the way that Bertrand Russell was interpreting him when uh, The Problems of Philosophy was written. Toward the later decades of the 20th century, people began saying, you know, Hume isn't just a skeptic about induction. He also is a naturalist, as it's sometimes called, about human knowledge. What Hume is skeptical about is particular ways of trying to justify our beliefs. He says, if you try to use these strategies to justify our beliefs, for instance, our belief in induction, you're going to crash and burn. We need a different strategy in order to justify our using induction, although he thinks it's perfectly natural and justified to use it. Okay? So what is Hume skeptical about? The philosophy of Rene Descartes. Okay? And we'll, we'll unpack that. Hume is also a naturalist who thinks we can know what we need to know in order to get around to the world. Okay? So let's start at the beginning. What is Hume skeptical about? He's skeptical that you can give what is what philo philosophy in his time, influenced largely by Rene Descartes, the French philosopher, would, um, would view it to be a proof. Now, many people say that Rene Descartes was the first modern philosopher. I honestly, I do not agree with that. Descartes is very medieval in many respects. One of the respects in which he is most medieval is his conception of what constitutes proof. His dualism of body and mind and so forth is also, I think, very, very medieval. And uh, you know, like many contemporary philosophers, I think it was just a huge misstep. Um, when I was in graduate school, a, actu actually a colleague of mine in graduate school who was a neuropsychiatrist wrote a book called Descartes' Folly, in which he argued extensively that Descartes just totally was off on the wrong foot trying to split mind from body. Okay? Um, but that's another topic. <laughs> Descartes' influence was very, very, uh, very powerful during Hume's time, and Hume thought that it was really uh, a problem for making any philosophical progress. Descartes had said, you know, there's all this extravagant skepticism around because of the breakdown of medieval culture, medieval institutions, medieval ways of thinking. There's all this skepticism, and a lot of it is extravagant, what we talked about when we talked about radical skepticism. I'm going to vanquish extravagant, as he calls it, extravagant skepticism once and for all. And I'm going to do it by basically doing this analysis, these meditations where I, I, I think about everything that I think I know and I dismiss any belief that is not either an indubitable truth, that is literally impossible to doubt, a necessary truth, or a corollary strictly deduced from those axioms, those undoubtable axioms. And that way, he says, using this geometrical model of philosophy, I will construct a fortress impenetrable to the attacks of even the most extravagant skeptics. Okay? So basically, anything the senses are fallible, anything we learn from the senses, any, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's just dismissing that, dismissing that, dismissing that, dismissing that. Finally, he gets down to the famous uh, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Ah, here's the one thing I can't doubt, that my doubting mind exists. Okay, 
Nietzsche, the 19th century German philosopher, laughed at that. <laughs> he said, you know, how incredibly dishonest. What he should have concluded was, I doubt, therefore there is doubt. Um, okay, so what's the problem here? This interpretation of what this I is. Okay. In the 1990s, someone published a book called Cowboy Wisdom. One of the first precepts of Cowboy Wisdom is when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Okay. Many contemporary philosophers, many 20th century philosophers would say, that's what Descartes forgot. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And many concluded that, in fact, Descartes, given his agenda, can get himself all the way down to the cogito, but he cannot, using the same agenda, get himself out of that hole. I think, therefore I am. So, okay, now what? Solipsism? No, I think, therefore, is a th there was a thinking substance. Whoa, time out. You're bringing in these Aristotelian metaphysical categories. Where did you get those? You have no justification for that. Now you're going to start, you know, sleezing your way back out of that, <laughs> back out of that pit you dug for yourself and allowing yourself all kinds of things that actually you can't justify in terms of the agenda you had before. Okay? So, <clears throat> yeah, as G.E. Moore, a very important 20th century philosopher, put it, if you actually fell into that hole that Descartes dug, there would be no way to get out. But the, reason, but, but the, the real crux of the matter is there is no good reason for ever falling into that hole. Okay. Now understand Descartes was not, was not skeptical about all these things he was dismissing. He says, how do I know that in fact all my thoughts are not the fabrications of an evil demon who has taken possession of my mind? You know, that sort of thing. Understand he was not seriously considering those things and he himself says that. What he was saying was, I want to make sure that I can slap down any argument a skeptic gives me no matter how extravagant it might be. So basically, he wants to get back to the point. He wants to get back out of the hole to the point where he's, he knows everything that just on a common everyday basis we think we know. Can he do that in terms of his agenda? David Hume says absolutely not. Absolutely not. First of all, if I can know only things that are undoubtable, we've lost inductive reasoning entirely. And 90% of what we use to get around in the world is inductive reasoning. Except only what I, can what I can deduce from these axioms. Hang on. Where did you get the rules of deductive reasoning? How did those get back into the picture? Oh, you just kind of snuck them in the back door, didn't you? One of Hume's contributions was he is the first philosopher in the West to really pay serious attention to inductive reasoning. And in fact, he's, a, he's an admirer of what was at the time called the New Sciences, which is uh, essentially Newtonian physics and allied kinds of developments in science. And he understands we're, reason, we're doing experimental reasoning. That means we're using induction. We have to understand inductive logic. We have to understand how induction works. And up to that time, nobody had really, nobody really studied it extensively. Okay? Um, I, may, I made the... Uh, suggestion, uh, more than suggestion actually, that Plato is aware of that distinction with the upper and lower parts of the divided line. Here are the things that we know because we sense patterns in nature, but those are beliefs. That's not, that's not stuff that we can know with certainty. Then above the divided line there are the truths of reason, and those are not things that come into being and pass away. So I mean, he's aware of that distinction. Hume is the first to point out, you know, modern science really needs to understand how induction works. It's not until the uh, 19th century, John Stuart Mill, a British philosopher, writes a system of logic, which is an extensive investigation of the actual mechanics of, of inductive reasoning. That's uh, such a good job that people very oftentimes uh, refer back to Mill or use some of Mill's materials when, they, uh, when they're trying to teach about induction. So, okay. I just heard a lecture where uh, the speaker started off by just slamming Descartes for being the, uh, being the reason why we treat animals so cruelly, because as far as he was concerned, animals are just little flesh and blood machines. They don't have a soul. And, uh, you know, it's claiming, I think, inaccurately claiming that Descartes was the uh, origin of that idea. In fact, Descartes was simply articulating a view that he had inherited from the medieval world. So, you know. Descartes may have been may have been one of the conduits for that attitude, but uh, 
again, this is another illustration of the fact that he was, in many ways, a very much still a medieval philosopher. So, Hume, <laughs> much more modern philosopher, says, okay, so supposing, supposing we accept the kind of philosophical orientation that most philosophers today want to accept, which is sort of a Cartesian approach to philosophy. Can we give a deductive proof for induction? Well, what is it we have to prove? All inductive reasoning, as we discussed when we looked at the principles of induction, all inductive reasoning gets down to this notion of the uniformity of nature. Patterns, which is simply the, the axiom that, the working principle, if you will, that patterns conscientiously observed in, in nature are likely to persist in the present and future. That means that we can, based upon experience, we can predict what the present and the future are going to be like. Everything from common sense to science requires that we be able to learn from experience, and that requires this principle, the uniformity of nature. So a whole lot is resting on this, right? Hume says, okay, well, very well. You can't give a deductive proof of it because we're not dealing with induction, we're dealing with induction. If this were a matter of relationships of certainty, we'd be dealing with deductive logic, we wouldn't be dealing with induction at all, okay? We can't use any proof from experience, we can't argue. You know what, induction has proven pretty much, when we do it conscientiously, it's proven pretty reliable in the past. So we should go ahead and use it, presuming it's going to continue to be reliable as long as we're conscientious about it. What's wrong with that? We're going to presume the principle of the uniformity of nature is a good working principle based on the fact that our experience shows that the uniformity of nature is a good working principle. Wait a minute, that's circular reasoning. You're using an inductive proof to justify inductive reasoning. Well, that's circular reasoning. You know, the whole thing that's up for grabs now is whether inductive reasoning is justifiable. You can't use induction to prove induction. That's just circular reasoning. You have no proof if induction isn't already legitimate. Okay? It's like saying, I know God exists. How do you know? Because God told me. Well, wait a minute. Okay? <laughs> You're begging the question. Okay? No ad hominem proof. You might remember that from informal logic. Ad hominem means you're attacking the person rather than, uh, rather than criticizing the person's argument. Okay, what would an ad hominem argument be like in this context? Well, Hume himself, in one of the, he actually wrote a few dialogues, and one of his dialogues has a character give a uh, very reasoned criticism about the foundations of induction. And when the character is done, another character says, that's all well and good, Cleanthes, but, you know, so I'm paraphrasing here, you're going to leave today by the, by the door, not by the second story window. <laughs> In other words, yeah, you can intellectually criticize induction, but then you turn around, you're going to use it too. It's an inconsistency. Your professed values and what you, the values, you, your professed beliefs, rather, and the uh, beliefs that you actually live by seem to be contradicting each other. Okay? Now why isn't that a good criticism? Well, if you point out that my, the beliefs I'm professing and the beliefs I seem to be living by contradict each other, it's still an open question which is the more adequate set of beliefs. I can believe that, uh, I can say, believe that the chances against my winning the lottery are astronomical. But if I'm then sneaking off and buying, spending all of my spare change on lottery tickets, I'm essentially showing that I still have this creeping hope that I'm going to win it. Okay, you might say to me, you know, you ought to practice what you preach. If I give a lecture about the importance of honesty and trustworthiness, then give everybody a break and they leave the room and I start rifling through their things and stealing all their cash, would you say, oh, well, gee, I guess, you know, since he actually is dishonest and untrustworthy, that must be the better set of beliefs, better set of values. No, you'd say, you hypocrite, you should practice what you preach. Your professed beliefs are better than the ones you're, you're actually putting into practice. So just pointing out, just pointing out that the critic of induction is likely to actually be using induction doesn't give you any reason for thinking that his professed beliefs or his active beliefs, which one is more accurate, okay? I mean, that question's still open. That's Hume the skeptic. You can't give a proof of the principle of the uniformity of nature, at least not the kind of proof that a Cartesian would want. 
Does that mean you can't give good reasons for accepting it? Not at all. Now we come to Hume the naturalist. Just the prevailing, the prevailing understanding of Hume from say mid 20th century right up through, uh, right up through the 21st century. In fact, the last really important work on David Hume that I know of that was written was one called uh, The Skeptical Realism of David Hume and that came, out, uh, that came out in the late 20th century and won the National Book Award for Best Scholarly Book and so forth and essentially is developing this notion that the most important part of Hume's philosophy is not the skepticism which basically is directed toward what he thinks are certain disastrous strategies for philosophy but rather the naturalist who is saying what is possible and you know how we're to assess that it's possible. Hume the naturalist basically says this. This is supposed to be a scale. I'm like the scale of justice, you know, a balanced scale. If I just said a scale, you'd say, yeah, it's a flat piece of metal and you stand on it and you have a digital readout and, you know, then you curse at it. Um, now, old-time balance scale, you put something on one side, you put something on the other side and see, you know, how they balance. Um, <clears throat> Hume uses this sort of an image and he says, the wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. He weighs the reasons for believing against the reasons for doubting. If the reasons for believing outweigh the reasons for doubting, it's reasonable to believe. If the reasons for doubting outweigh the reasons for believing, it's reasonable to doubt. If they are about the same, it's reasonable to suspend judgment and look for more evidence. Well, what if you have better reasons for believing and then some of those reasons are refuted or you have additional reasons for doubting? Okay, then the scale changes and realizing that your conclusion was, in, was a judgment, not a certainty, but a judgment. You adjust your beliefs to the evidence. A wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. What Hume is saying is we don't need this Cartesian certainty. And if we think we do need this Cartesian certainty, we're going to end up howling skeptics because there's no way we're going to get the world back. There's no way we're going to be able to justify inductive reasoning. There's no way we're going to be able to justify 90% of what we use to get around in the world if we adopt a Cartesian strategy. We, we will, contrary to the aims of Descartes, we will end up a bunch of howling skeptics. That's his term, howling skeptic. I kind of like that. <laughs> um, what Hume says is, look, if a belief is native, natural, universal, and indispensable, native, in other words, it comes to us by nature, sort of hardwired into us that we see the world in a certain way. It's natural. We don't have to be taught by our culture or by any particular belief system to reason in this way. It's universal. It's not, it's not limited to a particular group of people, but it's the way all human beings seem to act. And indispensable. We could not do any, we could not live in the world without it, okay, basically. Then we are justified in accepting it because the reasons for believing vroom, have tilted the scale way over to one side. Okay, is this native? Yeah, this is simply the way that we deal with the world. Hume, like, uh, like Plato, talks about you know, the, form, the fact that we're, so we sort of form mental habits based upon the uniformities of experience before we ever even think about inductive reasoning. Is it natural? Yeah, we don't have to be taught by our culture to learn from experience. Um, yeah, everyone around the world in every culture does. Is it universal? Yup. It's not an artifact of a particular tradition. Is it indispensable? We can't live in the world without it. That's a pretty, pretty robust notion of indispensable. It's native, natural, universal. We can't live without it. Hume says that's overwhelmingly good reason to accept it. And lacking better reasons for doubting, we are rationally justified in accepting. I'm going to refer back to Socrates. I know that's no shock. <laughs> but I'm going to refer back to Socrates in a dialogue called the Mino. Socrates says of those things we can know for certain, there are very few. But we don't need certainty to get through life. What we need is reasonable beliefs. A reasonable belief is a belief for which we can give an account. We're able to scrutinize it. And if the evidence goes against our belief, we're willing to change it. Okay? Reasonable belief is what we need in order to get through life. Hume is very much in that tradition of we don't need this, this extreme certainty. And if we demand it, we're going to end up helpless. What we need is reasonable beliefs. Reasonable beliefs, though, require dialogue, they require investigation, they require the, the humility to be able to sometimes say, I don't know. Or to change your mind when there's overwhelmingly good reason for changing your mind. Uh, 
very important 20th century philosopher, G.E. Moore, made a similar point about skepticism not being a privileged position. He said, if someone were to tell me, for instance, I have no good reason to believe there's an external world, there are no external objects. Moore said, I would wave one hand and say, here's one. I would wave the other hand and say, here's another. There are at least two. Okay, now, what's Moore's point? Moore's point is, look, if you want me to doubt the existence of the external world, your evidence has to be at least as good, at least as uh, compelling, at least as lively and vivacious, right, as my knowledge that here's my left hand and here's my right hand. What evidence are you possibly going to give me that's going to be so compelling that I'll, I'll come to believe that I have better reasons for doubting that this is my left hand and this is my right hand, okay? Hume takes a very similar tactic having given this account of why it's perfectly okay for us to go ahead, lacking a Cartesian proof, lacking certainty, to go ahead and use induction. It's native, natural, universal, and, and uh, indispensable. Okay, and he basically says, look, what kind of, you know, turn the tables now, what kind of argument is the skeptic going to give us? Can't give us a deductive argument because that's inapplicable. Can't give us an argument from experience because that would assume that induction <laughs> works. He can't give us an ad hominem because that's just a fallacy. What's he going to give us? What could anybody give us as a, as a good reason for doubting the principle of uniformity of nature and abandoning it that would be more compelling than the reasons we have for using it? Hume jokingly says, well, if any skeptic has such a proof, let him ride up on his unicorn and show it to me. Okay. The important thing to take away from this, beyond simply the notion of induction, is that we do not, in most matters, we do not need certainty. We need reasonable beliefs, and reasonable beliefs require dialogue, and reasonable beliefs require that we have, if you will, the, the bravery to actually engage the world, at the same time the humility to actually say, I could be wrong, and to listen to other points of view. Skepticism is not a privileged position. Okay? Skepticism, just the mere ability to doubt. Skepticism does not, is not a privileged position. You don't refute a belief just by introducing the possibility of doubt, what Wittgenstein used to like to call the mere possibility of doubt. Okay? You have to have better reasons for doubting than I have for believing, or else the skeptic loses. The skeptic has to make his case just like anybody else has to make his case. Okay? Just the fact that you can introduce some kind of extravagant hypothetical doubt doesn't mean that you have better reasons for doubting than you have reasons for believing. And if the reasons for believing outweigh the reasons for doubting, it is not reasonable to doubt, it's reasonable to believe. Okay. Now, that may seem pretty simple. <laughs> Think about how it changes the whole tone of philosophical dialogue. For instance, in ethics, How do you prove that your ethical precepts are superior to another? This way of living is better than this way of living. These principles are better than these principles. You don't have to prove it with certainty. What you have to do is give good reasons why we're going to be better off if we act this way than if we act this way. Is that such a big deal? We do that, we at least attempt to do that all the time. Nothing mysterious or mystical or inscrutable about ethics. You know, Here's, what I, here's the good that I think we will do, that we will achieve, that will allow us to flourish if we behave in this way, as opposed to the limitations of using a contrary set of principles. Yeah, okay, then I assess your reasons, and I assess what I think are the likely outcomes, and I look at alternative points of view, and that's how ethical dialogue is possible. Um, return to the, um, to, the question of, uh, to the question of philosophy of religion, okay, religious questions. Medieval times, they thought that they could prove the existence of God with a deductive certainty. I can give you a deductive proof that shows with deductive certainty that God exists. Uh, essentially, all contemporary logicians would say those arguments are, are rubbish. The logic is terrible. Okay? Hume, chuckling over those attempts, said, look, if we could prove with deductive certainty that God exists, why would we need faith? Okay, I don't need faith to believe that one plus one equals two. That's, that's ridiculous. And again, you know, if you analyze the logic, the logic, you know, a handful of, a handful of theologians 
will try to defend you know those medieval arguments, but most most logicians will say this is this is rubbish. You know, this is just bad logic. Incorporated for the sake of special pleading. Okay, does that mean that it's reasonable to believe that you know that God doesn't exist? Well, no. Wait a minute. Saying that this or that proof of God is doesn't work logically is not the same as saying God doesn't exist. Okay. What it means is you got to give me some other reason now. If both the, the atheist who says, I can show with certainty that God doesn't exist, and the, the and theologian who says, I can show with certainty that God does exist, those two people are going to have trouble sitting down at the table and having a dialogue. If a theologian sits down at the table and says, you know what? I can perfectly understand why an intelligent, reasonable, and morally sensitive person would doubt the existence of an all-powerful, benevolent God. But I think there are better reasons for believing than for doubting, and here's my case. And then the atheist sits down and says, you know, I'm not saying if you believe in God you're stupid or you're evil or you're malicious or you're, you're whatever, or dishonest or whatever. I understand that, you know, intelligent, morally sensitive people may have, believe they have reasons to believe in God. Here's why I think they're wrong. Here's my case. The two of them can sit down and they can talk to each other. They can have dialogue. That doesn't mean that the one's going to convince the other. That doesn't mean that they're going to homogenize their views. It means they have something to talk about and they can engage in a respectful, constructive dialogue. Because neither has to sit down and dogmatically say, I am certain of my conclusion. Each sits down and says, I have what I think is a reasonable belief. I have better reasons for believing than for doubting, or I have better reasons for doubting than for believing. And then the focus of the conversation is where it should be, on the issues, on the evidence, on the reasoning. Okay, is that kind of a different world <laughs> than if we don't have that alternative, if we, don't, uh, if, we, if we don't have this model? Yeah, of course it is. It's a much more humane and more reasonable world if we can say, you know, what we need is reasonable beliefs. Indeed, in science, uh, most contemporary scientists would say what science gives us is not absolute certitudes, but very reasonable beliefs, very well-evidenced beliefs. In principle, could new evidence overturn some of those beliefs? Heck yeah, in fact, it's exciting when that happens. Okay? So, beyond simply the question of induction, remember, skepticism is not a privileged position. Skepticism can be a form of dogmatism in its own right. Okay? What we're after is reasonable beliefs and humane dialogue. Thanks.